Hi, everyone. It looks like we have almost everyone. Missing court. Unless I'm missing your court. I don't see him. We have Eva. And Alexa said she's trying to get connected. Did you have trouble with your internet over there today? Um, no, no, but I heard, I did see a town update email that there was a break in a, there was a fiber break. Yeah. So town internet was down for a while. Do you not have that? I don't. Oh, that girl. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. Can't even use. the other services that we haven't given up yet. Um, <sighs> Alexa told me that she might have connection problems because she's have been having trouble with hers. And I just told her, no worries. If you don't show up, we'll tell everyone you changed your mind. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> There's Court. Court. So. All right. Let's get started. I know Alexa was having connection problems, but let's just get started and she'll join us when she can. Um, hopefully. Okay, I'm printing our agenda. 503, should we get going? All right, then I will bring the Concord School Committee meeting to order and note that we are being recorded and broadcast via Zoom. I'll bring the Concord Kyle Regional School Committee meeting to order. So why don't uh, I start because we're waiting on Alexa. Um, we have a new member oh. from Carlisle. Uh, uh, David's a lofty select board member. Um, Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself and say hello? Hi, um, coming you from Carlisle. I've just done one year on the Carlisle School Committee. Um, I've been involved in the Carlisle Schools since we moved back here in 2013. So through some PTO stuff, SAC, CEF, um, and, uh, and now here I am. Um, I'm a managing uh, director of a small private equity group. We focus on impact investing. And uh, I have two daughters, one in the high school, one in the Carlisle Middle School. And, um, I, I don't know, I'm just happy to be here. I, I love both, you know, the Carlisle schools have been phenomenal. And so far, um, the high school has been great. And so just um, ready to help out and get involved wherever I can. Great, thank you. Welcome, Sarah. We're excited to have you. There'll be lots to do. Yeah. <laughs> we won't let you get bored. <laughs> oh, uh, I guess. Uh, you guess my calling roll? Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, uh, yeah. Why don't I do that? Uh, um, Boat? Here. Rainy? Here. Oof. Court, you're muted. Oh, forgive me. Now you're better. No? Nope. You're here in vision anyway. He's here. <laughs> Wilson. Here. Mustafi. Here. Thank you. And Alexis. <clears throat> I'm not with us, right? Uh, not yet. <laughs> Um, why don't we uh, see if anybody has public comment. So just as a reminder, or if you haven't been on these calls before, if you have a public comment, uh, you can hit the raise your hand button at the bottom of your screen and we will see it on our list as you having your hand raised. I'm gonna reply to uh, Alexa's request. Okay. Oh, I didn't see. Oops. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah. Great. I don't see any hands raised for. Uh, hands raised. 
of a comma. Don't even know if you can do that. But, um, okay, correspondence. I don't know if um, Heather, did you have anything? Oh, wait, I thought there was only a regional one, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that was last time. I don't think so. Um, um, no, my bad. No, okay. we don't. And uh, cheers and liaison reports. I have not been to any. Well, actually, I could talk a little bit about the meeting that they just had between the uh, FinCom and uh, it was a joint meeting, Concord FinCom and the Concord Select Board, uh, talking about town meeting um, and going through a consent calendar and and that sort of thing. Uh, there seemed to be a pretty strong opinion to try to streamline the, the meeting as much as possible. Um, and uh, I think they've done that. There'll be a hearing on these articles again, uh, probably sometime in the next three weeks, I would guess. Um, it's the first of it. Anybody else have anything? No, just the town meeting scheduled, I believe it's for September 13th, which is a Sunday, starting at 1 p.m. with a rain date on Monday at 5 p.m. Yep, Doug White. Um, the only other thing we, um, should set our meeting schedule, Lori, thank you for sending out a doodle pool for us so we could get everybody's availability. Um, we can either do that now or we can do it at the end of the meeting after we've discussed things. Um, let's wait for Alexa. Oh, good point. Thank you very much. It's joining um, now. <laughs> Now. Oh, great. We can get back and introduce her before we jump into things. Yeah. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Bless you. Bless you. Alexa, welcome. Oh, she's just connecting. <laughs> so while we're waiting, I don't know if I was muted before, Sarah, but uh, if so, I'll say it again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for uh, stepping up to another another role. Glad to be here. Thanks. Um, so Alexa, welcome. Sorry if you had trouble getting on. Oh, muted. you're muted. Alexa, you're muted. Huh, she looks like she's talking. Sorry. No, there we I'm go. In the middle of nowhere in the woods, and our connection is horrible. So, apologize. <laughs> Got it. No problem. Um, well, anyway, we started to do introductions and then jumped over some public comments and everything. But um, let me jump back. We want to introduce Alexa Anderson, who's joining us on the Concord School Committee, and welcome you. As we mentioned last time, we voted her in to join us kind of ex officio at this point. She is. She will not be a voting member until Concord's town meeting in September, but she can join us as a non-voting member until then. So welcome, we're glad to have you. And do you wanna just give us a, a little on your background too? Sure, um, so grew up in Concord. Uh, I went through the public school system K through 12. Um, and I moved back to Concord Mm, years ago, I think. <laughs> so we and uh, oh, are you losing me? Yeah, we're losing. You're coming in and out. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, anyway, and um, if you can't hear me, so anyway, so I um was on the long range planning committee two, three years ago, and um, I was really committed to the work that we did there, and I thought school committee would be a great way to continue to um help the district move forward with that plan. Terrific. All right, we got that about the strategic plan at least. <laughs> we're, we're glad you have that in your sights and we'll, uh, we'll all be able to focus on it some more hopefully once we get out of this COVID planning. <laughs> um, so welcome, yes, thanks for joining us, Alexa. Um, 
And as we all know, Fatima Mezdad was also elected to our Concord School Committee and Thanks. she will be able to join Thanks. us as of Concord's town meeting in September. So we'll have her with us pretty shortly. Um, let's see, was there anything else? Now that Alexa's here, do we wanna just quickly get through meeting scheduling so we don't forget at the end? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, let's do that. We have, we have our doodle poll. The good news is uh, there was a lot of availability. I think the biggest question is whether we're kind of defaulting to every two weeks for a while and then adding and subtracting as necessary. Uh, and does that fit in with the, the budget and other schedules? I, my recommendation is to plan weekly and then if we can take a week off, we'll cancel, but I think you need to book weekly meetings for the month of August. Okay. Let's do that then. Um, I would also think we should look very carefully at the end of July and what we're going to need in order to take a first look at the reopening plan and then a second look that might involve a, uh, a formal support of it before it goes off to the, uh, to the state. Lori, do you want to speak to that? Yes, uh, we have a tentative meeting, I thought, scheduled for July 27th. Right. Right. So that would be the preview meeting, or lack of a better word. Um, and then we need a meeting that first week in August so that uh, the, the preview meeting will be the plan itself. The first meeting during the first week in August would be where I would like to bring you my recommendation for which of the plans mm -hmm. we use to open school and talk through that. So mm -hmm. it, the combination of those two. And then you need something on the commissioner's desk on the 31st, correct? Yes, so that'd be what I uh, bring you in as close to <laughs> full draft form by the 27th. And he expects it to be draft in effect also. He's gonna send me a much abbreviated template. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm feeling we're gonna be far enough along that I can respond to what he needs by the 31st. Great. If I bring you a good draft on the 27th. Now, since that meeting is going to be budget and this plan, <clears throat> and our practices on especially on such an important topic to discuss, then to have another meeting. And I'm wondering if, because this is so important, it might be valuable to the community and to the school committee to try to schedule another meeting that week. Yeah, we can talk about it. I think part of why we landed on the 27th was the challenging schedules, but we can revisit that. I think we're going to have to try to figure out a way. We will have to have meetings without everybody present. And, uh, and Eva has not filled out the doodle poll. So it's a little difficult you know, for us to schedule weekly if we don't know. Eva, do you think you can get to that during the meeting? Yes, I'll get to that during the meeting. I just came back from uh, a trip that there was no Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, I, have a, I think we're going to try to do that during the chair's report here. So maybe just have your calendar out in this week. That's awesome. Let us know if you can do it or not. Um, I, know, I know we need to do budget on the 27th of July. Jared's away the rest of the week. Right. And I would say as much as possible, we should still default to our Tuesdays so that we're not during well, prescription going out. But when Tuesday doesn't work, then we have the information on the other days. Right, but that's Monday and then the plan's not due till Friday. Right, I under okay, okay. So you're saying, in the I, I just meant in general looking further forward, but oh, in terms God. of that week, if you're looking at something else that week, yeah, um, that's different. Yeah. So I was actually just back and ask when you said another, a second meeting that week, you're talking the last meeting in last week in July. Right. I just don't know the logistics. If I think we, I personally would need to have something to look at. We, mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily think that's, I don't know if that's so, a reasonable expectation. Yeah. I would like, I would like mm -hmm. more time on uh, discussion and clarity around assumptions that underlie the three plans and then notably the budget is is another way forward instead of two meetings on the last week of July 
would we uh, would your team be ready for a discussion a week from tonight, Lori, so we could stick with weeklies? Go 13, 20, 27, and then revert to our Tuesdays following that, conceivably. Do you have the doodle poll in front of you? Would that make sense? To... I didn't do that week. I'm not here that week. In any event, you're not here that week. Okay. I, don't I think Heather's gone that whole week. I'm gone the whole week of the 20th, and I'm camping off grid, so no access. I get to your point, Cynthia, we're definitely going to have to have meetings without everybody, I'm sure. Um, but if, if we have a bunch of people gone that week, that right, so. makes more sense given the draft nature of this to do, to stick with our 27th meeting. Well, I, I'm not saying not to have the 27th. I'm saying that we um, might need another meeting that so week yeah, for the 27th. To stick, to leave Jared and Lori and everybody else alone the week of the 20th, because they're working on getting this thing done, um, and bring it to us on the 27th. And then if there's a day later in the week, uh, preferably the 30th, I should not do it on Friday, um, that we have a brief meeting on the 30th with the only topic on the, on the agenda being a vote on, you know, a discussion if there's any changes um, since Monday and a, uh, and a vote. Yeah, I think that would be good. And the if we really feel like we don't need it, then we can cancel it. Yeah, I mean, if we look at the 20, 27th, we're all sort of comfortable with where we are as far as what's going to go to uh, DESE, then maybe we can just mm -hmm. redoing the meeting to take the vote. But we've got the out to be able to talk about it later in the week if we want. It's Thursday at four or five. Good for everybody. Um, you can't make if points. it's short, Thursday is tough for me. But if it's a, if we're keeping it short, I can make well, I it work. I, I don't want us to be rushed. Uh, this is going to be hard enough to get it right, and we have not discussed the assumptions that are going to underlie the three plans. Uh, we haven't even started to uh, discuss the budget, so. I, for one, think it's a little unrealistic that we're going to knock this out in a big hurry and that we 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 stay silent until Jared and, and uh, Lori bake this thing completely um, for that final week quick review. I, I think that's asking a bit much. Lori, do you have, has Desi told you when they're going to give you that sort of the template form thing to fill out? Yeah, so that's due to me any time this week is the, what we heard on Friday. I think the template's going to be a very high level. I don't think it's going to be more than basic so they can see that we're doing the planning they've asked. Um, I think the full document we're going to create locally is probably more so what you're going to be interested in with more of the details in it. Um, so that said, I don't know how that helps with the an exact timing of how you want to put the meetings together. And has there been any indication that they're going to move closer to that 85 to 90 percent target of uh, that they originally originally said that you know the 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 state would mandate a big chunk, or does it seem like what they've issued is the guidance that's and that's how granular they're they're get? I think we're going to continue to get guidance on certain aspects of things. Um, transportation, extracurriculars, cleaning, but I do not, I do not believe we're going to have state mandated things. I think we're making local decisions. Um, so all we're trying to do right now is count. We're going to have a discussion about task force really. Um, can we settle in on Thursday and is Wednesday better for people? Seems a little tight from our Monday meeting. Um, I, I would recommend you go to Thursday because I we've tried to do this where they're close and otherwise we have to post before we've had the first meeting and it really was challenging because the agenda for the second meeting is based on what you do at the first. Right. So I'd at least leave you that 48 hour posting window in between. So Heather, are you better at four? Or I, I'm better at four if that works, if that's possible. Or even earlier, I just 
or earlier. I can do any time in the afternoon, actually. Just the e it's the evening that's tough. Could we do three o'clock and that'll give us? That's better for me as well. Great. And th three o'clock. Okay, three o'clock on Thursday the 30th. Okay, great. And then nothing the 20th, and then we look at the first week of August for weekly. I suggested uh, go back to Tuesdays. What do we think? Um, well, that, uh, let me see here. The Tuesday, we got, we've got five people who could make it on the Monday, the third. Uh, or Wednesday. Let me see about uh... yeah, Tuesday's less. So I marked myself as out all those three days because I'm not sure if I'll be able to make any of them, but I, I might be able to make it work. And I don't even know the likelihood on one day versus the other. I'll be on the road those days. But so once we schedule it, I will try to make it. I just can't guarantee it at this point. Um. But we do have more people available the third than the fourth, so maybe we should just do that. How oh, important will Jerry be can't be there though. I can be if I, if I'm the only one on the third, then I can I can I can make it. Even if you just came in for whatever portion of the meeting was. But I just had a dentist appointment during the day. That's why I'm up. Well, that'll be fun. So, yeah. Not a fun uh, dentist. So let's, uh, I think that's probably the best. Eva, are you in? What's your schedule for the first two, three days of August? You're muted. I can, I'm available those days. I prefer evenings or mornings, but I will uh, do what my journey needs to do. Okay. Is there um, why don't we do the third? Okay. Okay, defaulting to five o'clock again. Eva, do you want earlier or later? I can do five o'clock um, okay. on, on the third. Okay. Somebody writing this down. I am. Yes. Yeah. Not Aaron and I are too. <clears throat> so the next week, um, Eva, what's your availability on that Tuesday the 11th? Uh, not sure yet. I, I, I will make myself available because we are doing this through Zoom, it's much easier. So. If we are traveling, I'll get myself to a Wi-Fi um, situation. It was a, it's a little more trickier right now with the COVID-19, especially in certain areas, but it will work for me. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm in a similar situation. I'll make myself available. Should we just, if it looks like Tuesdays generally are at least as available as other days for most of these, should we default back to Tuesdays and say Tuesday the 11th, Tuesday the eighteenth, and Tuesday the twenty fifth. And Tuesday the twenty fifth. We just need definitely need to have a because Sarah's not available. <clears throat> yep. We can't have a meeting okay. if one yeah. is not Are you available. The, uh... yeah. Okay. Tuesday the the twenty fifth. If I need to move, um, if I need to move something. I... We also need a meeting on. First, because that'll be our last meeting before town meeting. Yep, and we have everyone there. Uh, oh, wait, no, there's two meetings. This is the eighth, the last meeting before. Yes, true. So we've got both of those, first and the eighth, and then we're also going to have to put a meeting on the schedule for Sunday the 13th. 13th. And Monday the 14th. Right. Right. One o'clock and five o'clock. Yep. Can we, on the August the 11th, can we start at four o'clock? Fine with me. Sure. Okay. Thank you. I guess we got that done, right? 
Okay. okay. I think we're one, good then. The other ones, are we going at five o'clock? The others, yes, are five o'clock. August 18, 25, September 1, September 8. Yep, let's just keep those all default Tuesday at five. Uh, great. Good. Um, anything else, chairs or uh, liaisons? Nothing here. Okay. Uh, I don't, it's not liaison. Do we want to talk subcommittees at all tonight, Wally and Heather? Um, why don't we? Uh, the policy subcommittee is on the agenda a little further down. A couple of times, actually. Yeah. We, why don't we? Can we talk about it? It's not on. I think. Yeah, why don't we just have a conversation about it during discussion? During the action items. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yep. let's do it there. Superintendent's report. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to talk at a high level about because most of my work is in the upcoming agenda items. Um, but I did want to just mention graduation is on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We are bringing families in to um, celebrate with the class of 2020. Each student uh, is welcome to bring two family members. They will be physically distanced in predetermined space on the field, uh, the football field. Um, contactless diploma uh, production. Uh, I think Mr. Mastrullo and I might abbreviate our speeches given the likelihood of a July temperature and sun <laughs> event, uh, but we're really excited and looking forward to it. It's felt like a lot of work coming to try to get to this. And we're just really thrilled to be able to give the seniors a fitting send off. So that is on Sunday. Rain date is the next date, but I actually, from what I can see, it looks like it's going to be a, a nice day on Sunday and we won't need to reschedule that. It just rolls day to day until we get one that works, um, but I don't see that we're going to need to do that. So, so that's our big uh, high level work, very focused on kids and we're looking forward to it. And uh, Court, thanks for representing us there. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yes. And have we cleared the fields for the, uh, for the day? Yes. Good, thank you. I assume that if other school committee members want to attend that, they can. Sure, just let me know. Yep. Um, Are we robed this year? What's up? I have not, We normally we aren't robed as administration and school committee. Okay. okay. Um, uh, one last comment, Wally, it will be streamed live on MMN, so we're, grateful that we can invite them over to help reach family members who can't attend and also to allow access to others. So. Okay. Um, so you wanna roll into the task force update? I do. So I'm gonna screen share a very short slide deck that will update some talking points and pieces that we need feedback on and just highlight where we are in the discussion process. And this is a conversation, so let's chat along the way. All right. So in sharing with you where we are, I just wanna sort of frame this for those who maybe haven't uh, been watching and engaged. Uh, and especially with new school committee members. Um, so we uh, in early June formed 10 different committees that are running. We have five at the district level and one at each school. Um, the district task force has been the spoke to all of the other work. There are four subcommittees around that, each of them as a working group focused on health and safety operations, blended learning, and on the whole child. And then each building has had a task force working on 
the implications of the decisions and the guidance out at the individual building level. Um, so just updates in terms of where we are for documentation and guidance. DESE released three documents on Thursday and Friday of last week. Um, some we've already referenced and I'm not gonna actually open them. These are live links, but I'm just for the sake of time. Uh, the plan, as I mentioned, is due to them July 31st. We do expect some structure to what they're gonna ask us to submit. I expect it will be a cursory level view of the entire plan rather than the complete detailed plan we will need to provide here locally. Um, and they have asked that districts hold off on making decisions about the reopening this direction itself until the first week in August. So my proposal to you is that that plan, the last week of July, outline the three models we were asked to make, but not necessarily indicate which one of those models we're going to expect to open with and make that part of our discussion on the uh, meeting, which I guess we just set for August 3rd and bring you my recommendation. Um, that, that would give time for people to see what the models look like uh, and also to read those details, knowing that we're on the brink of a decision um, August 3rd, which based on most of the feedback from parents last week and teachers too, as I've started to meet with them, I think we need the time uh, that the whole month of August would allow us knowing we need to watch carefully what's going on with the health data and be ready should we have to alter that initial direction. Uh, they've also created what might be a public friendly document of frequently asked questions, which I think does a good job of highlighting at a easier reading view than digging through the depth of reports that have come out so far, um, questions as to what families might be looking for and what the community might be looking for in terms of their guidance to us in a number of different topics. And then this was uh, something we were grateful to see last week, special education guidance was also released last week. So we are studying that and using that to inform the expectations and the direction that needs to get laid out within the three models. So this is the work we are currently doing. <clears throat> And it informs the models, both in terms of what's feasible and it potentially could start to inform what isn't feasible. So we've been conducting uh, space reviews um, with the goal that the state asked us to consider of students attending in person. Um, so we've been in the elementary schools as recently as this morning, um, some patterns that are emerging, which will continue to lead us um, as to what's, what the options are. We have good sized classrooms at the elementary schools, often um, 1,100 square feet, um, small class sizes. We are mostly in the upper teens to at most low 20s. Um, we've been looking at other portions of the guidance and tracking for that as well. Um, students are naturally cohorted in the elementary school to a large extensive um, manner. So we see that as a positive at the elementary in terms of the viability of in-person, potentially with the option of having all kids back. We're still considering that, looking at what the classrooms look like, how many feet can we get between students if we're to consider that. Um, so that's the work going on there. Middle school, we've been reviewing each building. Um, Peabody, the short Simple takeaway is that we do have the use of the whole building, which is a lot of opportunity and option available to us as we look at physically distancing kids. Um, the classrooms are also a good size. Class size is just a little bit higher, but truly it's the fact that there's an empty wing right now that um, allows for more discussion of potentially all students returning. Um, Sanborn and then the high school, we're definitely experiencing different conditions there. Um, classroom sizes are smaller in both buildings um, in the 
certainly at Sanborn, there's a lot of furniture that is normally meant for two children at a time, um, which now can only be used by one student at a time. So that's a limiting factor. Class sizes, again, are in the low 20s generally. So while that's not excessive, you put that in combination with the smaller classrooms, it could, could well become prohibitive. Um, and of course, the biggest structural difference at Sanborn and the high school in conjunction with these other variables is the travel of kids class to class. I've been talking a lot with my colleagues of cohorting of the secondary students is very challenging to consider an option for that. I'm not gonna say we've concluded that there can't be cohorting and I don't know, maybe the middle school's got more opportunities since we've got a team structure to work off of. Um, the high school, just I've, I've been on talking with other districts and really looking at our own processes and um, it, it has significant to impossible uh, ways that we come to it when we try to look at how to cohort students. So I don't, so that's a huge issue there as well. Um, also at the high school, the classrooms are smaller, class sizes are a little bigger. Um, they range considerably, but they are averaging a little bit bigger. The students travel all day. And just the pure scale of 1300 students in a building is leading us towards quite a bit of restriction and considering the option of bringing all kids back. So that this is high level right now and not something we're gonna tell you is firmly set. We wanna get through the task force processes and talk with you tonight and keep doing the rest of the homework. But um, there's, there's some restrictions there. I don't know that we would feel comfortable trying to bring everybody back. We're, we're, we're gonna keep talking, but that's the direction that feels like it's going. So then uh, the next step of what we had outlined was a survey. And I'm gonna show you the actual survey so you can give us feedback. The survey is very specific and direct to ask parents the likelihood of in-person school attendance for their children, use of school transportation and participation in the lunch program. These three data points are very critical in the planning process. While what we ask them to complete this week would not be binding, it would be very, very informative in terms of the number of students that um, would be looking to return. Um, transportation, I just wanna highlight that alone. You know, I, I think without the guidance, we have to use our common sense here. And I see a capacity restricted at no more than 50% on the buses. So if we aren't able to have parents assisting us, um, it could, it could be that we're prohibited in the model that we select just for that reason alone. Um, and then participation in school lunch, we know as the operations task force is meeting and the lunch um, professionals are talking and the guidance we've seen in other places and settings, we're heading toward, well, one, our, are people interested in us feeding their students in a pandemic? That's one piece we'd like to capture. But the second piece of that is what we will be serving um, is headed towards uh, prepared foods that we cook ahead of time. If we cook at all, they may be cold options that are wrapped and very different feeling than what we've done in the past um, and limited, limited options outside of that grab and go kind of model. So that also would be very helpful in our planning to know the likelihood. So the survey, let me see if it'll pull it right up for me. I have it pulled up, but yeah. So the survey looks like this and we would ask parents to do one for every child. Um, it's just simpler that way for the disaggregating. So selecting where their student will be and at what school. And the way we phrase this is really not to ask for distinguishing likelihoods depending on those two, although I hope parents would offer that in the comment box, but truly the, if we're in person, full-time or part-time, would you send your child to school or would you be looking to opt for remote learning? So trying to get data on that point. This I borrowed from Acton who created a scale in terms of the confidence of what people are reporting to us. Um, Again, that seems 
very helpful in terms of if you know right now, no matter what changes in the COVID environment happen, you're not comfortable sending your child, it would be great to know that um, versus unsure. And then some option for people to explain, give us feedback on other pieces of this, anything they wanna share. Then moving to transportation, directly stating what a challenge this is going to be. Um, and so if you plan to send your child, how will your child arrive? Asking people to give us an indication of the way they would transport, including students driving themselves at the high school. Um, same menu of certainty, and then an option for comments. And then just the last section repeats most of that with food service. If your child's attending, would you participate? Given the changes, we try to offer a little bit of the conditions that it'll happen in. An option to say you might. Um, again, the confidence level comments with a highlight. To me, this I think this is important. We want to be very sure we're serving our free and reduced lunch families. So I wanted to be able to get feedback directly on that if they so chose to say what may or may not be prohibitive. And then finally, we do need these to be with students' names on them if they're really going to be of use because to tell us, especially for example, in transportation, well, even in the classrooms, if we don't understand where the impact is happening at a very granular level, it may not be nearly as useful. The bus is the best example of that to just tell us what grade in school, but not actually be able to have us identify what bus run they might be on um, is very restrictive. So we are asking for names um, in order to be able to be that thorough in using the information. And it's uh, that's simple. So I'm open you, to feedback or comments. You described this as simple and direct and, and it is, I think it's excellent. My only question uh, is in regard to that last one and the, the critical nature of uh, data about, for example, bus runs. Um, after uh, after four months, do parents know what uh, what bus num bus route they had? I certainly wouldn't. Yeah, and we didn't. We're not asking them to tell us that. If they give us the child's name, we'll do that cross referencing. Okay, so that's all I agree. You need. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why do you, why is that the last question versus the first? Uh, it, that, that wasn't intentionally one way or the other. So if you think first is better. I would either put it first or mention that you'll be asking at the end for child's name. I would put it first. I was actually just gonna make the same comment. I'm not sure why, but I think it would give people more of a comfort level to know at the beginning that they're doing this with their child's name attached to it we, versus perhaps, realizing that at the end. I, I think we people want to know what they're answering before they decide if they're sharing a name. I did get quite a bit of feedback on the last survey when we put names on for the same purposes, but it had a lot of other topics on it. Um, it clearly had some people uncomfortable. In this case, it's more critical and hopefully where the information so straightforward, they're more, you know, it doesn't feel so, uh, so violating in any way. And they feel like can, they can be honest and direct with us, so. Lori, do we need a, uh, for number 12 or whatever number it ends up being, uh, a, a reminder that this is internal use only? Could do that, sure. The other thing you might do is offer, might be a can of worms, but I don't think so. Um, offer that people can call with their responses if they don't want them in a database. Somehow, I don't know. If, I may be overthinking it, probably is, but um, I mean, this is information that, you know, we're gonna know when school starts. Right. Um, it's not like, you know, what's your opinion about Confederate flag. It's you know pretty straightforward stuff that um, is going to be known come day one. 
So it's, it's I don't think it should be particularly um, controversial to put your name on it, but I think just having that up front is sure. Key. Um, and then do you give a phone option? My only hesitation on the phone is with us all remote, the phone is very challenging right now. Um, everything goes to our voicemail and then we're doubling back. So I, I would hate to frustrate anyone by offering the phone at the moment. Well, could they do the phone and leave the answers on voicemail? Maybe. I'm curious, Wally, what's the value to that? I'm not sure. I don't think I quite understand the value to that versus the process cost of it. Just, I mean, if somebody doesn't want to have their child's information in a living spreadsheet. But it's going to have to go into it anyways, even if it's collected by phone, isn't it? Um, yes and no. It doesn't have to necessarily. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not married. I just brought it up because it came to mind. It's not a big, I'm, I, could, I don't, however we settle in on that, I'm fine. I think it's an interesting idea and creative. It, in this scenario, I don't think it's necessary, but I'm open to other opinions. So Lori, just a little feedback. Um, I, I think many high school students would be shocked to know that they probably would not be permitted to leave campus to get lunch. We, we have that. not, I, I don't have a firm opinion on that or direction on that at this point. So I don't think I'd want to include that here right now. But I mean, that would be a significant shift in feeding kids. Yeah. Case. So it's yeah. a good point. Maybe even, even if we don't know yet, Lori, could we make a note that, you know, open campus is, not you know status of open campus is not yet determined so that people at least know that it's not a given that they can go off campus is there a reasoning why the students would not be permitted off campus because then they'll be gathering in groups doing not social distancing well you you have to have a culture of uh you have to believe that the students will follow the guidelines right you have to build a culture of masking and protecting each I other. Want, I don't want to debate. I'm just saying in terms of right. logistics, if that was the case, and just in terms of planning purposes, with how, you know, that's that could potentially be a lot of food. Col I, I'm just going to say the college uh, campuses are not doing that. Well, <laughs> And the, and, and, the, and the towns are enforcing mass policies around college uh, campuses that they have opened their doors to students. Well, we're not, a, we're not a college is what last time I checked. So it's just something that's probably in consideration and just for planning purposes, it might be useful information. That's all I said. Thank you. I, I okay. It might be a little premature. I have a question in terms of uh, the, the uh, calendar uh, changes, any possible calendar changes to um, adjust for quarantine that is required after people travel? Did that come up in any conversations with the state or any other district? It has come up with the state. Um, we do not have a firm direction, but it would not, it would not totally surprise me if there is an expectation of self-disclosure and two-week quarantine. I will not begin to guess from which locations. Um, I know in February, it was the international hotspots. Given the domestic hotspots, you would wonder if that's going to be the case if there's travel. I am going to work on that question, Eva, because I think it's an important one to get to families now as they're making choices this summer. And, and our families do travel, so it's, it's uh, yes. good to get feedback if that would be helpful to families. I completely agree. I have a question yes. about back to open campus. Um, do students have to have any things signed from home that they can leave the campus currently? I believe at the beginning of the year they do. Yes, they do. Because yeah. mm -hmm. that's the thing that would concern me would be, you know, somebody's got a car and 
to two of their pals get in the car and go. And, you know, the family is trying to be uh, as isolated as possible. Um, you know, that's sort sort of inviting the opportunity uh, not to be. Um, I mean, frankly, I would close the campus, but that's just me. I think in this time, it's not too much to ask that kids stay on campus. Um, that can I move on to our no, no. next slide? Can I ask one more question on the survey before we leave the survey, Lori? Sure. Um, my only one, and my feedback is that it's is terrific, like Corey, straightforward and clear, and I appreciate it. Um, and so I hesitate to introduce a possible complication to the straightforward questions. And so the question is really, is this relevant? It may not be. But I heard some comments from parents, and might have been in the forums or focus groups, that them saying, you know, oh, well, if I knew that it made a difference in terms of getting kids back to school, then yes, I would be willing to drive my kids back and forth. So my only question is in the transportation section, do we reference that at all in some way that, it, that as opposed to just, are you comfortable with your kid on the bus? Is, it, is the question more about, are you willing to drive your child if that means that we can get more kids back into school? Let me read it to you and you can it's tell me what it is. It's kind of implied. Okay. A major, yeah, a major challenge, it. yeah, a major challenge we foresee is a capacity of 50% or less on the school bus. If you plan to send your child, how will your child arrive to and from school? Okay. Do you think that's strong enough, Heather? I don't. I think it alludes to it. Uh -huh. um, it could even be, it could even mean another choice in the answers, which is I would be, you know, I would be comfortable with my child riding the bus, but I would be willing to drive if necessary, that kind of thing. Like th there might be a different, there might be an in-between answer there. Yeah, but we can't make it necessary. True. That, that, so gets, us, that gets, us, gets us into another problem. Yeah, okay, that's fine. I just wanted to bring it up. I'm not sure that there's a... But you, you could do something like what, what Heather's saying, say it's like if, you know, if... Um, I mean, if it means, you know, it would help or if it would be use, you know, if some kind of hybrid, there must be, there must be some kind of word where you don't need to use the word necessary, where you don't make it seem like all the burden is on that one family, if that they're the one that tips the scale between <laughs> right. and not, but, but to reinforce to that, that it might make a difference if enough people um, get behind that. Idea. Yeah. Or could we simply say that we anticipate that the state mandates will be that 50% or less kids can ride the bus in light of that, mm -hmm. then the question. Yeah, so let, I'll play with the wording. I, I, yeah. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah either of those. Of the question, you could get that across, I think. Yep, I, I, I can. Okay. I don't mean to reword everything here. That was my only comment. Thank you. Oh, that's why I brought it to you. So thank you. So the plan is for that to go out uh, tomorrow and Great. be open till Monday of next week, hoping that that way, if you're out of town this week, you've got as you return or vice versa. Um, I know other districts have had really strong responses to those kinds of questions because parents are eager for the plan. And I think they know that's a piece of the planning process. So. Um, all right, so the next topic, which let me just share again here with you. The next topic really is about, just get this a little bigger, um, the school calendar. And the reason I'm bringing this up, it's been brought up numbers of times at the state level um, with some consideration that the commissioner may reduce the 180 day requirement. That has not happened yet. However, I think if we look at the calendar, which hopefully my link will pull it right up for you. Um, we had set the schedule of entry for professional development days on the 27th and 28th and students returning on the 31st, they're in school then 
through the third. The fourth is a day in our contracts that is off. And then the seventh is Labor Day. Um, I don't have a recommendation for you at this point. We would have to reconvene uh, with the CTA and CCTA and they, they're interested in considering uh, regrouping on this. I, I think we need to look at potentially more professional development days before teacher, before students return. As we make these, build these plans, we can see the extensive work we're going to need to be doing in training and preparation and logistics as well as professional development opportunities still for this new environment teachers are in, whether it be technology or blended instruction or um, a myriad of things. Um, so I don't have a recommendation at this point. We'd be looking to work with the unions and some representation from the school committee as we did to build this calendar. Um, but I'd like to bring you a recommendation on the 27th and I just wanted to put this on your radar that if you're willing, we'd go forward to have the discussion. Absolutely, I think we have to be willing to have the discussion. <laughs> Has there been any conversation about, uh, uh, no, we don't have any vacations prior to uh, Christmas. Is there any discussion about shortening the school year and doing away with February and April vacations. I have not heard any discussion of the of those vac the vacations per se. Um, so far, the calendar discussion is focused on could the year be reduced lower than the 180, and really the opening of school. But that said, I think it's worth giving the whole thing a look, um, even conference days and things like that. I don't know what to say on the vacations with so much unknown between now and then. Um, what I and I put it in my slide, what I do have quite comfort in is uh, I would certainly hope we are not making up snow days and such given what we're doing planning wise for remote learning, um, which to me then starts to at least make the end of the year a given day without um, a lot of anxiety that it'll keep rolling into the late, late parts of June, so. Laurie, are the superintendent strongly advocating for reduction in the, like, mm -hmm. five, at least five days? And then what about the uh, number of hours? Um, so the reduction thus far, I can't say we've per se re recommended a certain amount. We're hearing a three-day reduction potentially, very informally. Uh -huh. um, but it's on the radar for sure at the state. The reduction in hours, the commissioner, I do expect will be getting from getting authority to do that reduction. I don't even know how you track that right now. No. So say you, you're in, yeah. I, I mean, you're gonna track what you put on paper, but beyond that, it's gotten, it's very different, obviously. Right. <laughs> so yeah. And even in the classroom, this is actually where the question came up the most was, if kids are in person with the extensive amount of safety protocols and changes to routines, to think you're going to take the regular day and have it equate the 900 or the 990 is not realistic. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, one question, Laurie, on the idea of the first days in professional development, and the answer may be you have no idea yet. But um, when when you say extra professional development days, is the idea to still have teachers start the 27th and delay students starting, or to have teachers start earlier? No, we're at the well, and I guess this could be up for discussion, but according to our contracts as of right now, right. Um, that is the earliest is August 27th. Okay. That's what I thought. We, would, yeah. we, we are suggesting the kids would start later. Okay, that, I, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure that was the case. And, and just in terms of the end of the year, we could look at where these professional days are in the calendar, although I'm a little reticent to give those up because with so many unknowns, you really may need the need time them. as the year goes on. So Yeah. So if you're in agreement, we could decide who's going to work with me. I know Cynthia was on the committee last winter. Um, maybe you could appoint who would go forward for the discussion. Cynthia, are you willing to do that again since you worked on the calendar before? 
It was it was so easy last time. <laughs> that wasn't easy at all last time. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it'll be just as easy now. Exactly. No, I'm happy. Last to time was deceiving though, because it was really you didn't see this crazy odd start coming until you got into it. This time you'll know it's going to be. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Let's. I think we should cancel Labor Day. That's my first. Thing. Oh, there we go. That's enough. That's good. When you come into this, it's like, well, how big a deal could the calendar be? Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> and then, you know, you wonder how come it's so hard to get anybody to serve on the calendar committee. Yeah. Um, Just a quick question uh, in terms of the snow days. Uh, would, uh, would we not have snow days uh, since uh, the kids can, uh, at this point, uh, the kids should be moving online to online uh, learning fairly quickly if uh, all the preparations are put in place? That is my expectation, Eva. We have not had official word of that, but if that isn't the official word, I will be very baffled. <laughs> so, just yeah. sick Lexington on them. <laughs> well, right. you know, I the truth is we're now considering remote learning a viable option for the regular school day. So I don't know why that wouldn't hold in a weather-related environment. So, <laughs> right. Can we talk about that a little bit? Just what's being done to. Um, enhance the remote learning from what we did under pressure in the spring? Uh, sure. Uh, at a high level, because I would like to package this up with the po folks who've been building it through the Blended Learning Committee. Sure. Uh, clearly, we're going to be looking at curriculum coverage of uh, large percentages um, to stay on track with as close to the normal curriculum as possible. That wasn't the case in the, in the spring. Uh, we're looking at curriculum that needs to be made up and we would want to be able to do that remotely. We're looking at schedules, grading, assessments, progress of where kids are with skill sets so we can still provide that. Special education would be direct service rather than um, the more office hours supportive mode we went into. So there would be um, direct research-based skill-based practices as we do during school. We've even started some of that over summer school this, this summer. Um, yeah, soup to nuts, it's gonna be different is, is essentially the answer. We um, very much feel we can accomplish that and build a really strong program that might, it's not gonna mirror the school day exactly because it's not in person, but will reflect a much closer proximity to the normal school year. Has there been any discussion about uh classes, <coughs> excuse me, um, where there are multiple cl classes of uh, a certain subject. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any discussion about having that, some of that just be remote and have one teacher or multiple teachers doing the remote piece, but you know, rather than trying to have multiple classes and multiple teachers doing their own version of remote um, for the same topic. Definitely there's conversation of teaming across teachers who teach the same thing. Um, it looks a little different at every level. Um, at the high school, it has to be among those who teach the same course. And there's certain courses where that's, you know, very plentiful. And then there's a good handful of singleton courses where that's not an option. So we've been in those early discussions. That's the work Kristen's working on with blended learning um, and the committee and making those kinds of recommendations. I'm also meeting with the CTA and CCTA, get into the more nitty gritty of those models. Um, it's still all in progress, but it's, I wouldn't wanna say it's definitive that we're gonna do that with every opportunity for that, but we see the benefits for sure. And so much, I hate to put depends on the end of every sentence, but some of that would depend on, you know, are we trying to service kid in a high, kids in a hybrid mode? That's one different way of managing the remote part versus all kids in a remote mode versus just a handful of students who can't come to school if everybody's in school. So we're actually breaking down all those layers within the models as well. So it all, Again, the data is going to help to drive that. You know, Acton, for example, um, when they got their data back and found that you know 15 to 20 percent of their population isn't going to come to school no matter what, they're creating a um, virtual academy kind of mindset with a real school within a school. 
I think that's the first step is to know what that looks like. And then we build within each of them and we are actively building. It's all very much draft by two weeks from now. It will not be though. So. I, I hate to go back to the, to the survey, but I know that there's been a lot of chatter of people who say they don't want to go send their kids back to school and know that they are already making an active plan to do an alternative mm -hmm. kind of virtual. Is there any, is, is you know, do you want to add something like that into the poll just so that you're not building something? If 20% of kids aren't coming, but 15% of the kids yep. are, are already enrolling somewhere else. Um, that might be. Yeah, no, that's what we're trying to capture. So thank you. Uh, next. If you're ready, the next topic is the timeline, which I think is what you're referencing here and the eagerness to hear more, which I completely appreciate. Can I just uh, ask uh, lastly for a, a, a region question? Um, sure. Was there any uh, exploration in, allow, uh, in reducing the numbers of courses offered to the high school students to provide a great opportunity for everyone to have more of a normal uh, schedule and offer instead of AP courses, offer the courses, uh, the dual, um, uh, the dual courses at the local um, community college. We have not looked at that. You, we definitely have the master list of all the sections and what we're looking to run. Um, we can talk more about it. I think there's there are positives like you reference. I think there could be some negatives in limiting the opportunity. So again, it's this trade-off of which, which gives us more options. Um, I know in my past, I did create dual enrollment courses and I'll be honest to say in a school like CC, which is the similar demographic and um, level of expectation, they were almost not enrolled at all because people were looking for transferable credits and that was often not credit that would be transferable. So that said, we are looking at virtual platforms that might offer, um, there, are there are companies, I don't like that word, but that's the right word, companies that have done this remote learning work and expanded it out to have a plethora of course options. And we are definitely looking at what that might allow us for more flexibility with the high school students where perhaps we don't offer all of the singletons, but they may be able to go online and do it in that sort of format. So, and still get AP credit or whatever to that extent. So that might go in that same direction, Eva, Eva of what you're talking about with a different tool. So, all right, so let me just show you the timeline. And I only brought it through the first week in August because that I see as the next milestones here, um, significant milestones with more to come as we get into the implementation. So this week, we've got a lot of uh, last rounds of feedback gathering happening, the survey being one, uh, meeting with staff at every building and student forums at the middle school and high school. We did both of those today at the middle school that occurs throughout the week. Very important that we get that next round of that feedback. The parent forums last week, I thought were very successful. The two bigger forums drew about 100 people each. The focus groups had about 20 each. Um, that information and summaries of those sessions are available on the task force webpage if people wanna peruse them. Um, so all of the feedback's been a huge part of the process here. Um, we do have this week working groups and building-based task force meetings. So we'll be looking again at those subcategories and moving forward. I think we're at the point much maybe to my own disappointment, without state guidance in some of these, we're gonna take guidance we see in other places and start to make local interpretations of that and do our best at approximating what we expect the state will, um, will be putting out. I've been studying other, other states as what they've put out for their public schools. We've looked at other um, settings, the higher ed, the private schools. I feel between all of that, as well as the guidance coming out of all of the major institutions I, and organizations like CDC and DPH, I feel we could at this point and have to start to make some approximations. So that would include 
as I've mentioned, transportation and food, um, some of the performing arts, although I don't know that we have to have every piece of that settled, extracurriculars and just reviewing where we are with the phase three guidance, the governors put out cleaning protocols. I feel very strongly we can find those in plenty of other places and even to open the workplace, we know there's a lot of great guidance out there already and just start to um, put all these concrete pieces together. Um, we have our last district. Well, it wasn't going to be the last, but it, th this is actually something I'm gonna bring to you in the first part of August as to what our next plans are. Our last full district task force meeting is next week on the 24th. Um, our meeting is now the week after on the 27th. We do have a uh, working group and building based task force meetings on the 29th. I think at that point we'll be all looking at iterations of the report as it's making its way through. So the draft will come to you folks first um, based on that last task force meeting and then to the other groups later in the week. Plan submitted to DESE and to the community with the major outline. And then that first week in August, I will bring a recommendation for discussion on um, the plan to open schools and whatever day we pick after we look at the calendar and uh, with a big, you know, if things stay the same. So I feel like that alone will help everyone to have expectations of when decisions are gonna happen and when people can plan accordingly. Feedback, comments, questions. Are you expecting uh, a date, a, a, a date, a particular date, where um, uh, coming from the governor that would uh, set some sort of guidelines around what kind of uh, community transmission would um, mean a shutdown for the school or taking um, uh, different steps in terms of uh, how we are uh, teaching our students on campus. Right. Is is that is that a, a question that has come up? Is there a, a guide? Uh, is, is there expectation to hear a, a, at a certain time uh, about this these guidelines, or it's going to be really left up to uh, this uh, district and the um, public health department of the town? I, we are expecting guidelines from the state on the protocols when someone gets sick. I don't know if it's going to take that, you know, um, more ground level discussion of if someone gets sick, who's getting quarantined, which I think definitely is part of what you're saying. But I also hear what you're saying is the infection rate in Massachusetts hitting a certain threshold. What will happen with the schools? I know the first one of those is coming to us in terms of if someone who gets sick, how, how widespread does the quarantine go? I hope, I very much hope that we get the same for the threshold of infection in the state level so that the districts aren't making individual decisions. That being said, I did hear some caveat that maybe is right. Um, you know, the Berkshires have had a very different rate at different points in this than say, you know, the Metro Boston area so what regional level should maybe that be happening on? Um, so I'm hopeful there's more to come. We aren't sure when or, or how. Even town levels are, are very, very different uh, around Boston. So it's, it's a very interesting question to, to, to hear addressed. I know the, the superintendents when, you know, we, we do have a lobby certainly with trying to make sure we're asking the questions we think we need answers to. So I know that question is going to the commissioner and governor and hopefully will funnel back to us as well in terms of those thresholds. So I have one additional question in terms of, those, uh, in terms of uh, uh, timeline and if uh, that has uh, come up. I know that in other uh, areas and regions of the country, the schools are uh, in uh, communication with uh, the businesses uh, that surround the schools, uh, setting cer certain, um, uh, not only guidelines, but expectations of what uh, behavior um, should be expected, uh, what kind of uh, adherence to uh, CDC guidelines should be expe expected in the surrounding area to keep the students safely uh, safe and, and the public safe. Is that Part of the conversations with, with Concord businesses, are, are they dates um, where the school um, administration meets with them? Is, is, is this under consideration? I can't say it is per se, although we can have more of this discussion and I can reach out through, I think, 
the town manager's office and talk more on that. Um, I think the tricky part to all of this is going to be where people get to make their own decisions and where they don't. I, I don't know the answer to that off campus. I feel very confident that once we set our protocols that students are expected to follow them on campus. I don't know where those lines would be off campus and nor do I know quite how we'd enforce it, so. I think one of our first stops would be the health department because they do a lot of business compliance work anyway. So I'm sure they're in that space uh, and could probably inform us. You know, where Concord has a mask order already in place, I would expect the businesses would enforce that with our students just as they would with any other patron. Mm -hmm. um, I think other spaces outside of that would be where we might talk on it. Since there's a local, local order that I think makes it simpler to expect that that would have to be the case if the kids are gonna look for service anywhere. Any other thoughts, questions? We've got a pretty, pretty busy couple of weeks ahead. <laughs> yeah, so just it, with your assumptions, and obviously this has been a huge conversation nationwide, the three versus six foot mm -hmm. um, separation. Right. Uh, what have the staff been talking to you about there? Because those are really the people who are most impacted, in my opinion. Absolutely. Um, yep, absolutely, so Cynthia. Yeah, no, there's a clear direction of their comfort level being at the six foot. Okay. Um, so we've been using that as we look at classrooms for informational purposes, we looked at the three feet and I'll be honest that most of me agrees with the staff just in looking what three feet looks like in the classroom, it's very different than six. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that alone starts to impact directions we could go, although I'll leave very much out there at the elementary schools, given the class mm -hmm. sizes and the spaces and with a very different mindset <laughs> of what a classroom might look like, um, you can get closer to a full class in um, than you might in some of the smaller square footage rooms. But it, it, I was thinking with the elementary schools is particularly, you probably want them to sit there and eat lunch. And they do need to take their masks off to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and there might be other, you know, reasons to briefly take off their mask just to show the teacher who they are so they can be <laughs> one kid from another, um, little things like that. Uh, so, yeah, we are looking at uh, building in mask breaks. The state's been very much recommending that primarily outside with distancing. Yep. Um, so we're definitely looking at where those few minutes would give you a chance to, you know, take it off and feel a little more normal. I, I've been in close, close contact with Concord Recreation mm -hmm. after they've opened the camps up the last two weeks in there. They're actually really positive about the, the kids and the management of the masks. Um, it seems to have become pretty tolerable and okay early on here. So that's good news. Um, and just one other question. I know we don't know what's happening with uh, sports right now, um, but uh, is there a notion of trying to build alternate programming? Because I know our kids are gonna crave some kind of physical activity during school, after school, and I know it's gonna be challenging to, to do that with distancing, but I know that that would be really welcome. So I just wonder- Very much, absolutely that is the intent is that we're building alternate practices and drills or, you know, just the whole yeah. community piece of, of all the athletics, even if they're not formally able to play their sport and compete and do all of that. So my intent and um, court and I met with the stipend committee this morning of the CTA, just laying out what those options are. So kids have them and there's opportunities there. And for many kids, it will be a, a really important piece of this return. So and I know there's quite a few yoga instructors in Concord. So and if we didn't have enough teachers who need to get home to their families to provide the after school act, you know, kind of uh, engagement, I think yeah. we can sort of spread it out. So yeah. And even if, you know, even if some of it has to be virtual, I think that's still yep. very okay and yep. uh, better than nothing. So yep. thank you. I'll comment quickly on Cynthia's first question about three versus six feet and uh, mostly because I was going to ask the same question. 
And so my comment is really appreciation that we're taking that six feet seriously, both for staff and the whole community really. And I guess I just want to point out one of the most poignant comments to me in one of the, forget if it was a forum or a focus group, was one of the parents who said, uh, well, you know, of course, yes, we all hear that kids don't catch COVID as much or get as sick from it, but they are part of our community. And as the schools, we are a central piece to the community and we have to look out for the whole community, which includes teachers and staff significantly because they're in the buildings, but also all the families at home and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I wanted to repeat that one because I thought it was very important and, and just say that I really appreciate that this planning group is taking that seriously because I think it's critical for us to all be thinking that way. Thank you. It was interesting. I think it's been worth the time put in to see how the various options felt and not just decide without having played played some of it out but it's yeah it's, it's different for sure mm. okay so that's where we are tonight there's a lot more to come um especially as all the documents get built here over the next two weeks from the working groups the big picture committee and then um the report my vision is that each of those there's a each of the working groups is going to create a report That'll also be embedded in the district-wide report. And then I'm already working on a more community user-friendly version of what will get released on the 31st. And then we are gonna take each section of the user-friendly um, community version and put that in as tabs on the webpage so that it's also easily broken down there um, and easily accessible. And is the, is the framing for the task force still that this is an advisory group? Correct. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks very, for all the work on this. Very good, Lori. Thank you. It's incredible. Well, you're very welcome. Thanks for all the support. And boy, what a, you should, you know, when I say out loud, we have 10 committees running, you know, I mean, that alone just says the level of support engagement in this community. And um, now that I'm really working uh, closely on the nitty gritty with the CTA and CCTA. So all that's happening in parallel. It's um, just been a really concerted effort. And, you know, we continue to need to listen and we'll do so. There's going to be no shortage of anxiety and need for support among everyone as this actually starts to come together. And um, we want to be sure everyone knows how committed we are to the health and safety of every, every single person who will be in our schools. Can I just say quickly too, because I think this is so central to everything that's going on, how much we appreciate the relationship that you, the administration and the school committee, but primarily administration and teachers now have together. And since you started a few years ago, Laura, you've been building that trust. And that trust that you've built is, is central to everything that's going on now in the collaborative way that this is happening. Um, because without that, this would be a really difficult process. So, boy, thank goodness for all the time and investment in in trust and relationship that has been put in over the past few years. Yeah, and I'm I'm going to just echo that. I know a couple of them are on here, so th they need to hear how much I appreciate the union leadership. They, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, their their roles right now are just as complicated as mine in terms of trying to be sure everyone's being heard and knowing, no matter how much we work together on a plan there's going to be people among the teachers and parents and community that just don't think it was exactly the right direction. So um, I'm really grateful for all the, the, what they bring to the table. They're bringing ideas and solutions to the table. I don't know that you could ask any more of a productive professional relationship where we're building it truly together. So it's, thanks. It's Heather. very much appreciated on for both sides. Thanks. I'm, I'm glad you noted that because that's, a big piece of this um, next steps to come for sure. Yep, it is. Um, all right, so are we, it, any other further questions or comments on task force work before we move on to budget? All right then, let's talk budget. Okay, not unrelated by any stretch. <laughs> is the money attached to all these plans. So let me just screen share the memo and Jared's gonna pipe in 
any place he wants. Um, so I wanted to give you a high level view of the philosophy and approaches here. I think, Court, you use the word assumptions a lot, and I think this is an attempt to give you those first round of assumptions. So as we've been rebuilding both budgets, uh, we've been considering a number of factors that have changed dramatically since the original build in the fall and winter of 2019. We are in the last stages, so we're honing in on bringing you some numbers on the 27th. We're glad for that. Um, and here are some of the pieces that have gone into that. So obviously we've been looking at three models, in-person, hybrid, and remote, and needing to be fluid. We've really been, as we're going to continue to be, wrestling with the impact of unknown revenue, given that we know receipts are on decline in the state and local level, and the federal assistance availability is unclear. Um, and then flat out change of mindset that whatever we built before may not include the priorities now. Um, and that means we've added and subtracted and reallocated and really rebuilt this in a way that I actually feel really good um, begins to address these very unpredictable needs. So here were some of the philosophies that uh, have gone into the these are more the outcomes of that philosophy. Um, so we've been talking a lot about maintaining staff given a varied range of new needs. So that really has meant that the priority aside from safety has been staffing. Um, we've really worked hard to preserve staff while making conservative uh, reductions or reallocations in other places. I felt very strongly as we met with all of the principals that they needed this cadre of uh, help available to them for needs we'd started to identify, but likely um, unknown needs that we can't identify yet. Uh, so really looking at preserving the tutors, the assistants, all of the really amazing resources that we are accust accustomed to with a new mindset, however, um, that depending on the model, depending on the model, their, their roles may need to vary and sometimes vary considerably. Um, and that, you know, I won't even limit that exactly to the support staff. I think there are certain positions in the um, professional, professional faculty that will shift considerably also just in terms of all the things we've just spoken about in certain settings not be available to them or certain needs needing to get figured out. But the people and the adult resources to our kids um, have absolutely been the top priority to preserve. Um, then we get into a lot of other smaller pieces that aren't small, but incredibly important, but in magnitude, very much smaller than maintaining staff at every school. Um, providing extensive educational software platforms. We have a very extensive list that we started to build during the closure and have now expanded upon so that we've got a really rich set of tools that both are skill-based or um, tool-based so kids can produce or kids can um, practice skills or even in the case of the lower elementary just the, the learning management piece and making sure that there's a um, structure for the remote learning to happen, which by the way is great for in-person learning too, right? We know Google Classroom was a tool we had before we ever would have thought of teaching virtually. So we've reviewed uh, materials, especially those shared by students. In some cases, that means we might be modifying the way we're going to be teaching. In some cases, it means we're actually looking at um, perhaps likely purchasing um, in collaboration with families, a little toolkit that kids can have at home if we're in any extended period of remote learning. For example, we were really prohibited in just our option set with the everyday math program because there were no manipulatives at home. Um, that's a very low cost example because we can just provide paper manipulatives, but just getting ahead of that sort of thing and providing these toolkit to kids. So we've been looking through all of that at every level and including the specialists, um, extensive discussion with the art departments. 
Uh, ongoing development of scheduling and space usage, really reworking schedules so that they fit all of our safety needs, but also maximizing efficiencies. Space, as you can gather from the other conversations, is something that we're looking at very differently um, with a new lens on all of the available space to us. You asked about uh, what would happen with visitors and things, limiting access to the buildings and the impact of that. Um, so for example, IEP meetings with parents, we don't expect to be inviting outside adults into the schools in the near future. And what does that look like? Obviously Zoom is the first go-to there, but of more substantial financial impact is daily substitutes. So we've actually taken a pretty different approach to looking at um, coverage within the support staff for substi per diem substitutes, not the long-term, but per diem, and really minimizing the finances we've allocated to those, those kinds of needs. Um, we know in a remote environment, we hired very few to, no, to know daily substitutes. That's to the credit of the staff who just to your point of teaming and collaborating, we're able to work with each other on an as needed basis. Um, the hybrid model will allow for more availability of staff in the schools with fewer students there. And then we just talked more and more of when we get to bringing in person, all kids back, looking at it very differently in terms of the role of the tutor and the assistants. And um, so that's been one pretty substantial discussion. We're building on, of course, we're building in contingencies. Of course, if we find that that's not working and we need to go to another option, but um, we did trade quite a bit of fiscal direction um, away from the daily substitutes. Limiting the travel of students outside of the buildings, we expect that needs to remain quite restricted early on. So we've reduced the amount of funding that the budgets provide for curriculum-based field trips. However, we did leave some for remote field trips because more and more the sites we go to are offering really amazing opportunities virtually. Our summer programs this summer are quite a bit more than we had anticipating, anticipated offering. Um, it is all virtual, but there are 400 students participating across the regular education and special education arenas. Um, we invited more students. We changed the thresholds for the uh, regular education provisions of the elementary school summer program. So we have about 250 kids participating there. And Ruth did some really amazing work at looking at um, the needs of the special education students, the way in which things had happened during the course of the spring and actually making great progress towards providing uh, direct support to them this summer, albeit virtually. Um, we see increasing needs for particular for professional development opportunities. Um, so I won't say there's a, a, limit, a lower need in other places, but we're prioritizing some of these areas um, and getting creative at how we come at it. So in some cases it had increased cost, but in other cases it was just reworking what we had. Um, so technology, our in-house technology specialists are offering a magnitude of opportunities for teachers this year and the teachers um, are volunteering um, to participate. We're not paying them. Um, as well as some social, emotional, and cultural competency, anti-racist opportunities this summer. And we are paying just the providers of those, um, those opportunities rather than all the participants. And the turnout's been amazing. Teachers are really, really engaged in working through all of the new, new things with us this summer. Um, we've also been looking at reworking curriculum. Kristen normally has a number of summer uh, curriculum work that goes on. It's often revision to courses or updates to courses or realigning with standard changes. And what we're proposing this summer, because essentially every teacher is in a position of needing to rework curriculum, we would propose that we pay one day's um, summer work equivalent to every teacher rather than targeting particular focus areas or topics. Usually teachers apply and Kristen's off, Kristen improves and it has to you know, be very concentrated and specific. And we would like to very much acknowledge the work teachers are doing all summer long to prepare for the fall um, with, with the need to tell us what they're doing and you know, a, a process to go with that. Uh, revision of certain program delivery. So that also has been part of the discussion. We just referenced the extracurriculars. 
um, performing arts. Again, I don't know that there's a financial trade to be made here, but we know the need is different. Um, in our, we did definitely study that and discuss if there would be fiscal impact um, in terms of what those options may be. At the same time, we were also sure that, uh, you know, is there a great likelihood of the theater programs running this year as normal? Probably not, but we didn't want to cut those funds so that they had opportunities for creative ways of approaching things. Clearly we had new needs for PPE. Um, Jared's done a great job of helping to front load that, which came out of some of the FY20 monies, but we also know there'll be ongoing needs. So making sure that's accounted for new needs for additional outdoor space. We're gonna to propose to you in the budgets that we um, put up tents of good size at every school for the fall and spring months. New need for health screening tools. Um, while, the, while the state has said we don't need to screen for temperatures, um, we did buy, we are looking to buy thermometers so that we have those on hand should a local decision be made or the state guidance change. New need for health service delivering cleaning protocols. So we're extensively working with the nurses offices and Russ as direct director of facilities as to what those look like. Right now in the budgets, we're um, looking to reallocate some support service to the nurses through um, receptionist type of help rather than medical help per se. We're meeting this week with um, Concord's Board of Health and what they can offer us for support. So there's still some ongoing discussion there. In terms of cleaning and custodial staff, we're gonna be meeting with the union leadership. Some of our ideas right now, we're very fortunate to have pretty, um, pretty good amounts of, of custodians in each school, but we know the way they've been operating can't be the way they operate. So to have a limited amount of people on during the day and then the bulk of them come in at night obviously doesn't make any sense anymore. So we'd like to relook at um, what the different options are with, with them collaboratively so that we can clean during the day as we need to. We know we need increased needs for social emotional support to students. So we've been factoring that in and trying to be sure we're at least preserving what was there. Um, and also providing additional intervention services. And I, I will say there's a lot of creative thinking there that uh, is turning right now into more reallocation than increases. Um, the need is increased, but not necessarily the, the resources that go with it. So that'll allow the budget zero based to, um, we went through and reviewed every line and rebuilt it based on these new environments. We reallocated quite a bit in different directions and trimmed where we thought we could hold off. Um, one thing I'll note just in terms of reallocation, we did absolutely factor in that there's three months worth of supplies in the schools as we reopen and that adjusted supply lines um, right then and off the, off the top, that was very helpful. Um, reviewing how we closed FY20, which will be a big part of the discussion as we bring budgets to you all and how the savings may be applied um, that is now available to us in the reserves. Reviewing contingency lines and approaching the many unknowns. Part of the discussion I would like to have with all of you as we bring budgets at the end of the month, the level of risk is a big part of the discussion because we plan for what we could try to predict, but it is not at all the normal planning processes. So, you know, are there places where we, maybe we're too conservative or too generous or did we, you know, what does our contingency need to be? There's a lot of discussion to be had there just in terms of how you budget in such an unknown environment. Um, finally, I'll just say we've been very limiting, very limited on allowing spending as school opens. We expect to maintain that mode. Normally in July, we open it up and there's a bulk of our purchasing happens in July. We are not approaching it that way this year. Everyone's being asked to identify things that they need to essentially open up. Um, and then we were gonna take it more as it comes because we don't wanna make purchases in July that either go unused or later we find, you know, even in the fact that the timing of this may be, we don't have a firm budget all the way settled just in terms of not spending money until um, we're a little more solid on revenues, um, work with the towns at both levels and then um, just being really cautious all year long, given how quickly things may change again. So I wanted to bring you this high level view of it and then um, you'll see all this start to play out in the budget budgets that we bring in the discussions and numbers that go with it. 
Jared, did you have anything to add before you take questions or comments or? I don't, that was very thorough. So he's, you know, keeping tally of how all this plays out with his fun in the spreadsheets. <laughs> And uh, they will bring you, we will bring you a summary view and the line item view in two weeks and talk through at that point. I know it looks like finance committee and Concord is starting to have some discussion. At least I know Wally reached out, Wally and Heather reached out to Dean today and they're gonna be meeting with different groups in August. Um, we can talk on that if that's your preference tonight based on what you learned today as well. I have a quick question about PPE. Mm -hmm. um, in Carlisle, we're trying to work with the different town departments to kind of consolidate our purchases and to, to work together. Is that same kind of conversation happening in Concord or is every school doing its own thing or how centralized is it and how spread out is it? So, so right now in the region, obviously the region we're doing it um, just all by ourselves. Same with CPS as well. Um, so we're getting very, very good, um, quotes and, 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 and prices and everything, uh, but we have not combined with the town. And haven't, you haven't combined either. It's, there's no advantage to. Well, I think Sarah, you bring up a good point because maybe it wouldn't advantage the schools much being perhaps the largest purchaser of some of the PPE, but it might benefit other town departments to at least uh, to do a check-in with that question. Yeah, we certainly will. I talk with the town manager all the time. We'll certainly reach out to them and see if they'd like to do do anything there. I'm, I will not understate the level of sharing and uh, of materials so far during the crisis. So I'm sure that will continue, but we'll look at whether the purchasing process is to benefit us. And then, and along those same lines, Lori, the after-school programs are going to be located at this, or that is a, a possibility. Yep, that's that is the direction it's going. Yes. And so again, that it would make sense to somehow or another share that expense with Concord Rec yep. if they're indeed running the program, so we don't have to put, you know, this is Concord Rec's portion and this is the CPS portion kind of a thing. So. And we are, just so you know, we are keeping track of, you know, the wipes and stuff that we bought for the rec department for the summer and they do, uh, we do bill them. Yeah, so in some, I mean, that's a good example. Sometimes it happens more in a fiscal collaboration rather than an actual purchasing collaboration. So. Gotcha, thank you. Any any concerns, <coughs> uh, Go ahead, Court. Sorry, any, any concerns about uh, availability of uh, of health-related equipment, not PPE per se, but other school-specific uh, barriers and so on uh, that might uh, see a mad rush later in August. I know we want to be conservative and not uh, simply wantonly buy for the just-in-case scenario. At the same, by the same token, there may be things that we are pretty confident we need for which there's gonna be a backlog. Is that so? Jared, you first. Yeah, I, I was gonna say we, we got out really in front of this. Um, and I know you said not PPE, but especially the PPE, we were out in front of this. Russ Hughes, the facilities director, you know, March, April. Some of the equipment that we got, we got these spray guns that did have uh, quite a bit of a lead time. Those are now in. So we did get those um, thermometers, even though we're not required to use them right now. Uh, I believe we got about 78 of them. So um, I think the mad rush is right now, and I think we beat a lot of it. Okay. And in terms of our building service folks, uh, I trust they've had their summer vacation such that we can press them into service for preparations when we know what they're going to look like. So they're actively working. We've been, you know, rotating vacations. So they're making their way through their normal summer cleaning in preparation for August to be focused on the reopening plan. Great. Yeah. The only the only um, more safety item that I'd say we're struggled with a little, and I guess we're still figuring out the needs, but the plexiglass ordering is 
first of all, the prices have gone through the roof. And second of all, it's hard to find probably more the first than the latter. So that's one thing we keep discussing. Mm -hmm. okay. We did get some sheets in. Uh, I don't know the quantity, um, yeah. but we, we do have some in, but yeah. That yeah. Is so we, we're all set for some of the main offices and places where it's just very obvious it wasn't going to work the way it was, but um, that's been one of the one of the few challenges I think at this point is to order plexiglass on mass would be cost prohibitive. Surprise! The attorney general hasn't gotten involved yet, honestly. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have we dropped a dime on that or not? Yeah, I haven't yet, but you know, it might be time. Um, oh, sure. you want a little update about? My conversation with uh, Dean. Now, yes, or... please. And then I have one more question on what Lori and Jared just went through. Um, let me. I'll jump in with that quickly. It's more of a high level question, but um, based on discussions in the the operations working group, which is the one that I've been a part of, you know, several uh, discussions there because of the people in it who are very experienced in in these operational aspects from their professional life. Um, because of that, the discussions have multiple times highlighted that all of the preparation to get kids back into school in this scenario could cost much more than before. You know, this could be really expensive, et cetera. So I guess my question is, knowing that and knowing that we've seen the possibility that, boy, this could be more expensive than normal, do you feel like in the, in the themes and high level areas that you've taken us through, is there one or are there a few that really stand out as, well, these are the risk areas that could you know, bump the, the total cost way up? Or do you feel comfortable that we're kind of reallocating enough that that's not as much of a risk at this point? So it's kind of a high level question, but what's our upward pressure risk here? Do you want to answer that or you want? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I have to almost go category by category. So for example, educational materials, we have funded remote educational software, which obviously doesn't have to just be remote, uh, but we've funded that in a way we hadn't funded before to the, you know, pretty significant increase. But we made decisions to then look at what we had for supplies, you know, and some of this is because we're fortunate enough to be well-resourced going in that we're coming through this with more options than other districts. You know, what did, what did we not use last year? Um, how are we going to have to instruct differently and really thinking all that part through? Yeah. What I think has happened in other districts and I'm just making assumptions based on high level things that I hear, if they didn't go back and do that part to look at what, what else is different besides adding the increases, it is going to be more expensive. Yeah. Um, I think if you don't do those two in partnership, um, you could end up with a lot of just additional cost in, in all directions. So that was why we felt strongly we needed to go back and zero base it. Um, so. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. That's great. So the reallocating is really helping us to, to weather this. It is helping a lot. It great. is helping a lot. Great, thanks. Okay, sorry to derail us. Wally, oh, an update from uh, the meetings you went today would be great. Yeah, I had a brief conversation with uh, Dean Banfield, the chair of the FinCom. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're challenged with getting information from various town departments about what the effect of COVID is on uh, budgets. Um, certainly not the least of which is our numbers. Um, and I think when you look at what they have to do once they have some numbers from us, which probably is the first week of August before they get those, um, you know, they're, they're backed up pretty close to the town meeting before they can give us what their guidance will look like. Um, you know, one of the things that he talked about uh, a good bit was, you know, they, they've got this five-year sustainable rate now, which was 
2.16, I think, prior to COVID. Um, and it looks like that number is going to be down somewhere around 1.7, um, which would be the, you know, sort of the guideline they're using in their thought process for, uh, you know, keeping tax increases sustainable over a period of time. So I think it's important to know that lens is there. Um, one of the things that's, that's, you know, we do our, People are thinking about all kinds of ways to handle what may be higher expenses than we anticipated for whatever the need may be. Um, you know, we care, we're, we're fortunate enough to have uh, a fairly high level of free cash in Concord. Um, but before fiscal year 20 actually uh, closes up, some of that's going to get used um, and it's going to be, you know, there'll be, we aren't going to have the kind of leftover funds, the surplus funds, once the budgets are closed out that we have often had in the past, which is where that free cash balance comes from. Um, and in fact, there's already been a decision made to use free cash. Every year we typically have defrayed the next year's tax increase with an addition of some free cash to the budget. Um, so that, you know, that puts a little downward pressure on the tax rate. It looks like the only way to do that this year is to take some money on free cash. So a decision has been made to use $500,000. It's usually more like a million. Um, so that's, uh, a drain on free cash even before we get into a discussion about fiscal year 21. Um, and, uh, you know, they're going to be looking at, at what things are across the board and uh, having discussions with us about what our budgets look like. Um, I think it's really beneficial that we're going to be able to go in. And I, I mentioned to them that, you know, we're going to be zero basing, or we are zero basing, all these scenarios. So, um, you know, we're not just coming in and giving you some, you know, we need X number of dollars because this is what we're seeing. We've really taken the exercise that we've been doing for the last couple of years and and uh, and applying it here. So, um, you know, my hope is that. Um, we'll, we'll be able to have enough discussion with them in the month of August um, to explain where we are and what we need. Um, and I think it's going to be important that, you know, whatever those, you know, this, this is a big undertaking and there's a health risk involved here. And um, at some point, you know, we have to, uh, we as a community have to determine, you know, what are we, able to do here uh, if we have to dig deep to get through fiscal year 21. Um, but th there'll be hearings um, because enough has changed that uh, I don't feel it's, it's uh, it'd be, they don't feel it'd be the right thing to do to just go into town meeting without having another round of hearings. Um, there will be some articles that will come off the warrant, um, even some that are, I don't think there'll be a lot, but some that are financial related. Um, and, uh, you know, so I guess one of the things that comes out of that is we probably need to think about whether we should have another budget hearing in the beginning of one of our meetings coming up here. I'd say yes is the answer. Um, I agree. So, you know, that's kind of, I'm uh, just looking here, um, you know, normally that we will get the normal letter that we get at the end of August. Um, and, and the reason I shared that one seven number is that that number is gonna be in that letter. Um, you know, it's unusual that we get that, which is meant for, you know, in this case, FY22 budget development um, 
prior to voting on FY21, but that's where we are. Um, so that'll be, uh, uh, you know, that number will be public um, and uh, not public, determined before we go to town meeting to vote on FY21. Um, so that's, you know, I mean, it's, it's a lot of moving pieces and it's a time crunch and everybody's trying to get done what we're trying to get done right now. Um, so they got their work cut out for them. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think there's much chance to tighten up the timescales. Wally, that, that's very helpful. Um, just to keep the community very sober about what we're dealing with. Yeah, uh, the administration is going back to the budget, but we also have a commitment at the present time to maintain staff and re rework staff to have them uh, continue to be as effective as they've always been, but maybe uh, in, uh, in a new fashion for some of them. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so I fear that uh, none of us should get our hopes up about uh, what we can do because we're going we're gonna to quickly absorb what is estimated to be additional costs for a district of our size. Um, we've yeah. got to be ready for those numbers to come in. Yeah, and I think it's going to be important that we, uh, as a committee, are well versed in that and prepared to um, support what we need. Yeah, and I, I guess the one last piece I'll add is that part of the zero basing and the rethinking and the philosophy, we're not bringing you lists of additional staff either, which could easily be part of the discussion right. um, if we weren't willing to relook and do things differently. So hopefully we'll be able to explain that as well. And we're not also, we're also not looking for additional space. Right. Which comes with a added cost and that'll be and you know when you listen to what they're trying to do in Boston it's you know any square footage they can find they're trying to secure which will come at a big cost so um, I'd say we're in a lot better shape than uh, many other districts around the state yes completely right um, one of the things that's important to you know is the uh, I guess the only other piece I'll mention. We did talk about receipts of uh, uh, in revenue-based tax, um, which is non-existent right now. Hotels, meals. Um, the uh, but there's also the convention in this scenario that uh, while property tax receipts are very strong right now, um, if we do start to see uh, pressure in that space in Concord. Um, we won't see it until, you know, the, maybe the second quarter of this coming fiscal year uh, into the next two. And uh, property that's got mortgages on it, the banks are going to pay the taxes as best they can uh, with what they're receiving. They're going to be reluctant to foreclose if that comes to that. But if they do start doing that, then that's when we start to see a dive in uh, tax receipts. Um, you know, we've talked already about what 08, 9, and 10 looked like, um, and it was not dramatic. Um, this is different than that. Um, it could be worse, it could be better. Um, we just don't know yet, and we won't know for a good bit of time yet. One thing we think we will know, imagine, um, is that the $225 formula per student, we are expecting to get uh, information to apply for whatever our share of that will be this week. Um, so that will be helpful to at least know what to what extent that's gonna be helpful to us. Um, there's a lot of talk of federal federal assistance heading to the schools too. We'll wait to see how that plays out. And then a lot of talk of 
active lobbying of the chapter 70 formula at the state. So trying to be sure that holds. So lots more to come, but at least one piece looks like we'll get some direction this week. And Lord, part of your presentation on the 27th, will you be able to either recommend any changes to the CPS capital warrant article, what you would like to see for town meeting? Yes, we will bring you that. Has there been, uh, you know, we've heard a lot of noise from the president and uh, Secretary of Education about, you know, pulling federal funding if you don't go back to full class size. Are the discussions with the department, with the Department of Education, uh, a little more tempered? Do you know? Just, I'm not going to tell you the details, but just the opposite. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Wow. I thought Massachusetts isn't going to let us go without funding. Um, oh, I I yeah. But it's just you know, not the place. Okay. See you in court, right? <laughs> yep. Save that for cocktail hour afterward. <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts or comments on budget? Um, or the process as we go forward over the next couple of weeks? Uh, just a quick question, doesn't need uh, much of an answer now. Will the uh, budget discussion to come uh, look at student fees, Lori? Uh, I was not, ex no, I was not anticipating any changes to the fees. Gotcha. That was not on my list. Yeah. Thank you, good to know, thank you. Probably the one court, I'll just say that I, I would like to talk about uh, charging the typical high school athletic fee because that's what's going to allow us to do all of the extracurriculars we've been talking about. Um, if we don't charge the fee, I think, and make clear to families that we need the fee regardless of what role, you know, whether there's a competitive environment for coaches to coach or a different environment, the fee is an important piece of how we sustain athletics at the high school. So that I think is worth having a discussion about, but nothing new. So it's going to have to be much clearer to people that uh, that's uh, an immediate right. use of a, of a revolving fund that uh, yeah. make, makes that possible. Absent that, we're absent those teachers. Those coaches, yeah. And coaches, yep. Yep. thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. So, too many things going on here. Um, so the, the two of our subcommittees are to talk about here. One is um, what's on here, policy subcommittee meeting dates, um, which in day also entails adding two, right, court? Two additional members to the policy subcommittee, one from Carla. You're on mute. Court, you're on mute. Court, you're on mute. I'd yeah, be so good about muting myself. Uh, <laughs> forgive me. Uh, uh, don't let my wife know. Um, so, uh, yes, we need a Concord and a Carlisle member of the policy committee, and we've got uh, work uh, that we were quite uh, engaged in until we suddenly suspended it in, uh, in March. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, the bio that Sarah gave us, uh, I know she's done some work over in Carlisle on their policy process. Do you wanna, is that something you'd be interested in doing here? I can do that, yep. Yeah, we kind of, we, we changed how we looked at it and made a little streamlined way of, um, of addressing. I don't know how you guys have done it in the past, but we had a kind of a cobbled together way where we would tackle a few policies every now and then. Instead, we consolidated uh, within the committee, made the changes or suggested changes, and then voted en masse on a big chunk of them to kind of not have... And our process wasn't uh, too dissimilar. Uh, we started the year trying to 
go through all of our policies knowing that some hadn't been uh, been uh, looked at closely for some time some of them didn't have adoption dates on them and so on so it was it was a, a cleanup effort but then it moved uh, toward a cleanup when we could but also uh, attention to ones that became priorities and so we're trying to knock out some of the priority items now and then we'll go back to the more exhaustive uh, uh, scrutiny of, of the entire policy handbook. Okay. And we had spent about a three year period of time, uh, I guess my second, third and fourth years going through the policies uh, one into the other. Um, but, you know, it is important to keep up with changes to GL and uh, yep. changes to what's going on with uh, in the schools, as we've seen. So, okay. well, uh, that, I can do that. And what we're waiting for is uh, the likelihood that, uh, that uh, the uh, MASC will uh, is issue some recommendations as to policies that in the COVID era, probably need a uh, a relook. But that hasn't come our way yet. Yeah. Which would be the things we'd want to, if we're going to do anything this summer, would be the things we'd want to be focused on. I think. Yeah. Um, that was mentioned in MASC's uh, advice to committees, uh, which I saw for the first time today. Maybe it's been out longer than that. No. I don't um, think no. So who from uh, Concord would like to? Can I just clarify before people speak up that right now we're just looking to fill the roles until town meeting, because as of town meeting, we officially receipt. We will have one, as in receipt um, all of our members. We will have one more member, um, remember Fatima, who has been elected and will join us. Um, so at that point, we will need to decide among that group of us who will be on the yep. uh, policy subcommittee permanently. Uh, I think Vadim actually does have some interest in policy. So that's not to say we save space or not, but just that right now we're only deciding for the next couple months. And then once she joins us and we have a new uh, committee uh, uh, group here, we will decide then long-term. So right now okay. we're looking for the next couple months. So would it be fair to say that that's for the Conquer rep, uh, that the Carlisle rep basically is is on for the year. Oh, that makes sense. As long as that, you know, it's so it's not Eva change. and Sarah, as long as that works for you guys. <laughs> yes, I don't see that as a flip the coin here. So. <laughs> right. so for the, exactly. So that's what I was bringing up now. For the Concord rep to join Court and Sarah, we need someone who is joining for the rest of the summer and then we'll decide long-term after that. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, Court, you had brought up to uh, Heather and I the budget subcommittee. Oh, wait. Well, oh. we need to establish who that last person is going to be. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. Go ahead. So is there any other interest? You'll do it, Cynthia? Yeah, I'm happy to do it. Wonderful. Oh, or Alexa said too. Well, I think we, we need a vote. Uh, she can join us, but we she would not fulfill our court. Oh, right. We need a, a voting. Oh, right. Yeah, forget it. But uh, certainly would be helpful to have you yes. come to the meetings. Okay, great. So, Cynthia, you said you're willing yeah, to Yeah, just to learn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just you to can learn. certainly attend to learn, absolutely. Um, okay, then. What do you want I to do about we'll, dates? Uh, do we need to? Oh, we'll make it a vote later during action items, but that's great. Now we have three. What about dates? For the next, what's the next, when do you want to set the next meeting? Uh, I think we'll uh, do that offline with the members. Okay. And with Lori. Good. Since we don't we, have to vote them. We also have to check in with our MSC rep who yeah. typically attends. He's available. Yeah. I would say it's probably be good to wait until at least the first week of August, given all the work that's being done now to get ready for 
Yeah, I don't want to negotiate with Lori about anything before the 1st of August. <laughs> I've got to tell you how those are going to go. <laughs> uh, going to go into some underground for the next two weeks or something. <laughs> so, uh, Court, you brought up the budget subcommittee, and uh, um, I just want to, we, I know we had discussion about this uh, in this past year about the benefit of continuing the subcommittee based on the practice we have of zero-based budgeting and that we've got a, a pretty consistent approach now. Um, and I think, in fact, we really didn't do much this year with that, mainly because the budget subcommittee was formed to look at the current, in this case would be fiscal, would have been fiscal year 20 uh, activity. <laughs> and also to help the committee have a better understanding of the zero-based process and, and the way what at the time was a new superintendent and a new finance director were going to look at this stuff. Um, so, you know, I think, so were you, what were you looking at as far as the yeah. inquiry about that? Yeah. So, so here's my thinking. Um, it was uh, a, a little unclear to, to me, at least, uh, when we left this discussion behind as to what role the chairs might want to have, what role the policy, the, excuse me, the budget subcommittee might want to have in regard to two, uh, two areas of attention. One, uh, ongoing oversight of the budget underway, uh, and two, the preparation efforts. Um, and I'm content with the fact that uh, uh, a budget subcommittee could in fact uh, work uh, both, both uh, uh, areas of attention with a, uh, a charge that is pretty simple. And it would look like this. Uh, be the subgroup that had access to our director of finance to get closer to detail on the budget, have more dialogue about the budget, get a deeper understanding about the budget so that uh, we didn't have everything done uh, agenda driven at night in a school committee meeting. Uh, but we also had as part of our fiduciary responsibility, this subgroup that was expected to roll up their sleeves and spend more time and be more knowledgeable. Now that may sound uh, too, too uh, uh, imprecise, but I, I just, uh, one member here, I'm not sure we have enough time in public session to uh, have us uh, dig down and understand two budgets to the degree that a uh, school committee might. So I'd offer that up for discussion with other members. <clears throat> I have some thoughts, but does anybody else want to weigh in on this? I have some thoughts too, but I was going to let others. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm going to say, let's see how things go on the 27th. But I think that the, these discussions are so complicated and so complex. And as we embark on trying to maintain our FY21 budget and look forward to an FY22, which in my mind is gonna be incredibly challenging on so many fronts. And I think that's where we're really gonna see our slowdown in receipts across the board have a much bigger impact. Um, I just think we, we're gonna to have to spend extra time um, outside of our regular meetings, but publicly. Um, and I think that will give us the opportunity to do that without, um, you know, having excessively long school committee meetings where I think we just get sort of tired out and don't give these topics the kind of detailed analysis they might require. This is my... uh, Cynthia, to that point, I would offer up uh, this, this might be to Jared's benefit because if there are 
two people who think along sort of similar lines, well, if there's a third and each of us have to seek out Jared independently, I'm not sure that's going to be efficient. So I guess I would just ask um, what kind of detail you're thinking about. And I ask that because, and I should back up for a second and say when we first created a budget subcommittee a few years ago, I was one of the ones saying we need a budget subcommittee. So everything you said court at a high level makes sense to me. Um, I've, I've shifted, I guess the direction at least of my thoughts a little since we started the zero based budget because I feel that it is significantly more clear and easy to understand. And so with what we're typically brought now, and again, maybe this will be answered more in a couple of weeks when we actually have in front of us, but with what we're typically brought now, I feel like it's a pretty clear, detailed presentation of budget. And so I'm, I'm not sure what further would be brought to a budget subcommittee. Cynthia, you look like you're talking, but you're on mute. <laughs> so I think you're saying that what we put together, but the landscape is so unclear. And that's where I'm concerned that we can really, perhaps individuals might want to drill down. And that's the thing is we can funnel that work in a separate public meeting. Whereas we, I just don't want to, you know, to really do the work properly. And maybe as, you know, we found out from our prior work, Maybe that we don't need them, but I just think that we we might look at trying to do something where we have the opportunity to have, and I'm not saying we have five hour long budget meetings, but just the opportunity to go through, because you know, I do think we're gonna be trying to do two things at once um, in September and, or August and September and October. <laughs> uh, that's just my concern. Um, I mean, maybe we can, if we have school committee meetings every week, maybe we will have the opportunity to have the conversations, but I'm just worried that there's a lot to get through. There is a lot. And I guess that's what concerns me. About this. I, I, my concern is that we create more meetings and then instead of being able to do the detailed work on the budget, Jared is preparing for meetings with us more, not preparing the doing the budget work that he needs to do. So I, I guess I wanna be clear about what, what it is that we're bringing to this process if, if we're having extra meetings, if, if a budget subcommittee is having extra meetings. The, uh, I wanna be careful here because uh, personally, because you know, what we're talking about is going forward and I'm not gonna be on here uh, <clears throat> and really, <clears throat> I think if there's any vote about committee for next year, it should be taken by, for this year, I guess, that we're in now, that ought to be taken with the new members in it. But um, I will offer historically uh, what I have experienced. And um, first thing is, and we've talked about this uh, in the budget subcommittee discussions in the past, uh, when we're creating budgets uh, and weighing alternatives, um, they're often very sensitive items under consideration that uh, had not to be in a public meeting until there's been a further analysis and some decisions made about direction, um, the, which is always been the rationale behind chairs being involved in budget development and is why we chose to have the budget subcommittee be focused more on uh, the existing on the current year and the, what's going on in the current year. The other thing that, you know, Heather mentioned this a bit was you know, zero-based budgeting gives us a better sense of, you know, we're not making as many assumptions. So there's not as much room there to, you know, to sort of have discussion about 
you know, should we move this one way or the other? Uh, because we're we're making some big assumptions. Um, and unless you're in a period where you're changing, you're trying to add or have to take away service, um, where you know you've got to really do some of that uh, balancing of priorities and and expectations, um, or you're in a situation where um, you've got difficult financial times. Um, you know, it it has not been particularly challenging to do, you know, from the standpoint of the committee to be able to understand what's going on and for the administration to be able to tell us in a fairly concise way, uh, you know, what changes have been made, what, it's, what assumptions are being used. And we've all, we, in the past few years, have been of the mind that, you know, this is our biggest responsibility as a committee. And as far as upcoming budgets, it's good if we expend the energy to all be aware of what's going on rather than try to, to put that in the hands of, you know, one or two or three people. Um, so I don't think much has changed there. Again, if, you know, if the committee going forward wants to explore doing that differently, then uh, that's a conversation that I think that the new committee ought to have. Um, and I also think this is so complex right now that for us to try to get involved at this stage in any detail prior to the 27th um, and prior to what we uh, ultimately put to FinCom and the town um, is asking an awful lot of the of Jared and Lori and Jared's staff, to, as Heather said, to prep for, for those meetings, um, especially uh, have not having anticipated doing that. Um, and if we can get as much information as we can a couple of days before the meeting so we can digest it, um, it might make for a better discussion in our school committee meetings over the next three weeks, which is probably the amount of time we're gonna have before we have to start to tighten up the budget and tighten up what our recommendation is gonna be. Um, the, uh, so I, I would hesitate to get too engaged in that right now. I know I've, you know, as a chair, I have not been trying to impose myself on that process um, just because it's, you know, I mean, we're trying to do this at a time of year when, you know, we wouldn't be trying to get a whole lot accomplished, let alone creating budgets. Um, so so that's, but, I, and then the last thing, um, this is gonna be a challenging year, both for fiscal year 21 and the activities that go on based on what we experience of, you know, which we, we don't know what will happen yet. And there are different costs depending on how we're doing the learning. And so there will be likely more adjustments necessary than we've experienced over the past few years. Um, and as, as Cynthia pointed out, um, there's gonna be a real challenge about receipts and revenue, fiscal year 22, fiscal year 23. And it may be worthwhile having a subcommittee that's focused on those externalities um, to you know, be able to interact with other town departments, notably FinCom and, uh, and the town uh, finance director uh, around what expectations were we're seeing and what anticipations there are and you know what level of analysis needs to be done to prepare for the budget process in those years, which are, are difficult. So we're not getting down to brass tacks at the end of the season and, and struggling with, with some of those things. We've made some of those assumptions and done that analysis earlier on in the process through a subcommittee, but that's, more than two cents, but 
So that suggestion is basically that a, a budget subcommittee's role, and again, we, we are talking short term here over the next couple of months, but that the role would be to interact with other entities in town that are relevant and focus on those, as you call them, externalities, basically trying to help collect information to feed into the, the process in the group, right? I just want to make sure- much talking about fiscal year 21 development and talking on that front more about fiscal year 22. Okay, as a, think, as a going forward suggestion that we could discuss later once we're a new seated committee. I mean, we're going to be, we're going to be, this is going to be a pretty aggressive time scale between now and town meeting uh, for everybody, including us, to be, you know, able to uh, support a budget, decide on and support budget. Um, so I think trying to make any adjustments right now to the process that's already underway um, is, uh, I don't think is wise. And I don't, you know, I think we should be doing the work we need to do as a, as a committee relative to the budget in our in our school committee meetings um, with as much information <laughs> as we can be provided prior to and incumbent upon all of us to have gone through that carefully so that, um, that we're prepared um, to have discussions um, and conversation over these, well, it'll probably be the next three or four meetings because it's by then, I mean, I don't know, we haven't set a date for when we wanna vote on a budget to put to town meeting. We probably need to think about that. Um, but, you know, I doubt it's a month out. Um, Let me ask a question if I can. Um, it, Court made a comment about this could be helpful to Jared in creating it. Um, so let me look at two, windows of time here, basically from now until the 27th, when you bring us a line item budget, and then the window after that. In either of those two time windows, Lori and Jared, is, is there a value that you would see something that would be helpful to have the interaction of a budget subcommittee? I don't want to put words in your mouth saying, oh, that'll be extra work that's not valuable. So is there is there something that you would see as value in that? Or would it be extra, you know, meeting preparation that would take away from what you're trying to get done? So in essence, what's most supportive to you guys? Can I go ahead, Mark? Sure. So I guess I, as I'm listening and um, thinking through where we are, I, you know, rebuilding budgets in a few weeks is pretty, unheard of, but we're doing it. Um, and then you're right, 22 is gonna flow right out of this. We also have a committee with a considerable amount of turnover happening. And so I think the part I'm wondering is if it would be worth putting a budget workshop on the calendar where the whole committee gets together, including the new, you know, all the new people coming on board. Cause there's clearly gonna be no window where we would normally do a workshop kind of retreat. I don't see how we're going to be able to do some of the ways we've operated in the past. I guess I'm wondering out loud if we did a workshop somewhere in the final weeks of FY21 build and then knew we'd want to do another as we're building FY22. I wonder if that gives the whole committee the opportunity to learn the budgets, hear what we did and why, um, ask all the questions of what goes into each line and builds those structures. And I just wonder if that would be worthwhile to then make the formal meetings where we are on a different time frame, um, just high level informed discussions because people have had that work in a, you know, in a more thoughtful, thorough, three hour window or something like that, where we literally do go line by line with everybody and just help them all see where these budgets are at and what's gone into them. Um, and Lori also lay out the budget development process. Yep, absolutely. The whole thing, Cynthia, right, 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 right. And, you know, lay out the, the process has stayed the same. The timelines have become incredibly accelerated for both 21 and I'm about to know 22 too. But yeah, go through the whole thing and, um, just see what the needs are at the end of that. I'm a little hesitant to commit to one before the 27th, given the other things I need to deliver. Yeah. But I think 
sometime in August, I, I'm sure we could get in a, a workshop to go all through and then see where we're at. Um, and maybe, maybe expect we need another one while we're building 22, a little earlier in the process maybe, since we'll have the gift of uh, you know, months to build that one, <laughs> so. Right, and the other thing is, that, you know, traditionally, you know, how are you going to dipstick throughout FY21 to figure out it's going to oh. be, yeah. Oh, the, the build of FY22, I actually think is going to be harder because you're going to be trying to build out something that's almost a year away in the most unpredictable environment we've ever been. Right. So I actually think 22 is a harder task, believe, believe it or not. <laughs> and I think, um, again, I don't think anything, I don't think any thoughtful school committee would lock in anything at any particular time that we cannot you know, it, according to law, <laughs> make an adjustment to. Yeah. Um, so I think this is just, you know, I think for now it's an excellent suggestion and we'll just have to see how these things, un un you know, flow. I like that suggestion. Court, does that address your need to get, to have more of a detailed walkthrough and discussion period? Well, we're, we're getting closer. Um, but at, at the risk of uh, uh, echoing Mary Storrs, um, we heard reference a few minutes ago to reports coming to us a couple of days before a school committee meeting. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's uh, acceptable with something as significant as a budget given our responsibility. Uh, and I don't think that uh, concise reports at school committee meetings only are adequate for this school committee to have the, the confidence that it wants to have in the budget. Um, I know we're gonna have that confidence, but not simply because we uh, champion the virtues of zero-based budgeting. It really requires work. A, a budget requires an analysis. Uh, and so I, I would like to see uh, more effort made and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do it independently, but I I see this as a school committee need, not as a personal need. So you're saying, when you say more effort made, you're saying more effort made on the part of school committee members to understand the budget in detail. We have three primary roles. One of them is budget. I, and, I agree. I was just clarifying what you were saying. And I don't think we can uh, do our oversight role, our support role, as effectively as we could should, if we uh, get uh, reports a couple of days prior and can only uh, debate them under rushed circumstances with concise summary reports coming from Lori and Jared. So, and, and I make no apologies to Lori and Jared. I mean, this is, this is their job. Uh, uh, and, and I don't think that these references to grand preparations to have a conversation with people about school budget is legitimate. I think they're ready most days of the week for a conversation about the budget. Uh, I, and I don't think we want showboating here or, you know, lots of work on presentation. Uh, I think we're seeking understanding. So I, 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 I would submit uh, that I'd be distressed if this was in any form at all, that more attention to the budget by the school committee was uh, gonna be unnecessarily or unfairly burdensome on Laurie and Jared. Just don't think that could be so. I don't think that should be so. Mm. But again, how it happens, I don't care, you know, but, it, but you heard me. I think we need to be more attentive to our responsibility here than we have been. Okay, so what if we go with Lori's suggestion of a budget workshop uh, sometime first week of August or so? Sure. Is that too soon? Sure. Is that what? Is that too soon? I think it's going to be when she's ready before, uh, but with ample time so that new members and current members and outgoing members all uh, have a good grasp on the changes that uh, are necessary, uh, the changes that are being recommended, the budgets in toto that are gonna be recommended for town meeting. Um, 
Yeah, I we did think... the workshop. Uh, sorry, John. We... Mm -hmm. Emma, you just went mute if you can still hear us. Yes, okay. so we did a workshop last year and it was very, very helpful. For our okay. new members, it was very, very helpful. Uh, it was very educational. We spent uh, quite a bit of uh, time on it. Um, it was very helpful. Okay, so let's do that. Let's, let's make that our plan for now. Um, and in terms of talking long-term plans, we'll wait until we have our new committee seated. And we can always add something else in August, you know, if, if need be, but this sounds like a good step for now. And we're leaning toward uh, not early August, but something, something later. No, I think, I think it would make good sense if we brought you on the 27th, the high level view, and then we do the budget workshop the week after, because then you'll still have time for part of the regular meetings to discuss where you want to land with it. That's the budget we try to bring you is I bring you a recommendation, but it's just that. Um, and then you'll have all the all the backup information that went into the zero base build the first week in August. So July 27 followed by budget workshop followed by uh, your more detailed work on the budget. As needed. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And all of that prior to when we would vote a budget. Yep. For ten right. Yes. Well, I guess we were rather uh, sensible in setting all those meeting dates. <laughs> <laughs> well, these would be in addition. And this is an addition to them. <laughs> oh, you mean these I mean Thursday pay. meetings? You mean I'm going to pay for this, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <sighs> I bet you're glad that we've rolled over and your salary went up another 50%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if we are we complete on that? I think no. so. We'll just have to do the actual scheduling at some point. Maybe it's a doodle poll again just to look at that week and when it makes sense to have a budget workshop. So okay. we'll have to find a time. Um, so anything else while we're right here at this portion that uh, we need to bring up? Discussion wise. I think we're good, but just asking. I think so. So we have two action items. Um, they are both uh, uh, regional. Um, why don't we take care of the first one? Um, and this is about, well, why don't you, do you want to tell us, Lori, what? Sure. So I, I'll first start by saying this is not happening in the right order and just symptomatic of the chaos of the last couple of months. Um, we were approached by a CCHS parent um, wanting to recognize the class of 22, given the, at that point, I'm not even sure we were certain we were gonna have the in-person ceremony. Um, offered to donate a tree and plant it. It happened to, the offer happened to come within a day of us being notified by the Concord DPW that we had a dead tree along Walden Street. So that's probably the other reason it moved along so fast because we saw a connection there. Um, so the tree was was planted um, two weeks ago, maybe. The same, a donation of equitable amount was made to speak for the trees in Boston um, in acknowledgement that the Boston graduates can enjoy the tree out here in Concord as easily. Um, so we're asking that you would uh, accept the donation and um, allow us to formally um, process what we were so grateful and uh, graciously accepting. This doesn't mean we're having this ongoing plant a tree thing every spring or anything like that. This really was about trying to recognize the class of 2020 and in all that they lost and a, a really you know generous donation from a parent. So. So uh, could I have a motion that the Concord Carlisle School Committee accept the donation of a tulip tree planted on the CCHS campus to recognize the class of 2020? So moved. I have a moved it, I'll second. Um, thank you, and uh, any discussion? 
Well, with uh, to echo Laurie, uh, with uh, sincere thanks uh, from the school committee, from the administration, on, and on behalf of the high school. Yes. Second that. Thank you. Yeah, that's very generous. Um, and also to think of the Boston kids. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, roll call vote. Uh, Rainey? Aye. Booth? Aye. Hout? Aye. Staffy? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Johnston? Aye. Usher carries. Um, thank you very much. And the next item, uh, just show how we like to do our business in public. Um, we need a vice chair of the regional committee. Uh, I haven't talked to anybody about this. <laughs> so um, it's a two month, basically gonna be a two month appointment, I think. Um, after town meeting, you'll select a new chair and a vice chair. So um, for both committees. So, um is there do we have to flip a coin or is there somebody who would like to volunteer to be vice chair is it appropriate this be a carlisle member wally certainly could be um i don't know that it has to be but it uh, doesn't have to be okay. certainly okay. i mean and it does not mean that you are committing to becoming chair of the region as of town meetings. It's really just we need to fill this seat for the next couple months. So this is this is a uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, we simply want to have this person in place for the operational uh, requirements. Yeah, of the committee for two months. And in the event that you know, I mean that really, the only activity would be if I can't. Chair meeting Go between ahead. now and end of town meeting. Anybody? Court and I are taken on chair and vice chair roles yes. already. So yeah. basically, Cynthia or Eva or Sarah, <laughs> it's up to you. I'll volunteer. Go ahead, Sarah. Sarah. I mean, any I'm not being a... Pardon? Eva? I may not be in a good Wi Fi area. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I have reliable Wi-Fi for the next month. Okay. So uh, there we go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Join us and jump right in. I love it. <laughs> uh, so is the uh, can I have a motion that the Concord Carlisle School Committee votes to appoint Sarah Wilson vice chair through Concord Town Meeting September 13, 2020, rain date 2014th. So moved. Can I move back? Yeah. Yes. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? With thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Grabbing the first meeting before they get in there. <laughs> um, all in, uh, we can't do that. Uh, Rainy, you're muted. Can do that again. You're muted. You're open now. Hi. Hi. Uh, Booth. Aye. Out. Aye. Mustafi. Aye. Wilson. Aye. Johnston. Aye. Thank you. And uh, I'll try to miss a couple of meetings just so you can ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think we're ready to adjourn to uh, executive session. Wait, we need to vote. Don't we need to vote the new members to the policy subcommittee? Yes, uh, we decided, yeah. but we didn't vote. Correct. Okay. Why don't you do that? Okay, so can I have a motion for both committees to appoint Sarah Wilson and Cynthia Rainey to our policy subcommittee, of which Court Booth is already a member? So moved. Is second. that for both? For okay. both, thank you. Somebody want a second? I probably should. Second for both. Thank All right, you. good. Any further discussion on that? Thank you for serving. Mm -hmm. Then by roll call, Rainey. Aye for both. Booth. Aye for both. A Johnston. Aye for both. Mustafi. Aye for Regent. And Wilson. Aye for Regent. 
All right, and bowed aye for both. So that passes unanimously. <laughs> Thank you both all very much. Good catch. We don't have to do that next week. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Um, okay, so uh, uh, we can have a motion um, that the Concord School Committee and the Concord Kyla Original School Committee will enter into executive session under purpose three of the open meeting law to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and not return to open session. So moved. Second. Not for both. For both, thank you. Any discussion? Uh, we are- uh, Wait, who seconded, sorry? Second for both. Okay. Um, everybody know what to do. We've got another different meeting that we go into. We have a separate um, link for executive sessions. Does everybody have it? And we will not be returning. Yeah, and uh, we'd probably take five minutes before we reconvene. Great. Thanks. Okay. All right. Bye. Wait, Thank you. See wait, you. we didn't vote that. Ah, dang it. <laughs> Molly left. All right, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> we need to vote that by roll call. So, Rainey? Aye for both. Booth? Aye for both. Wilson? Aye for Regent. Mustafi? Mustafi, Iva, you're muted again. Aye for Regent. <laughs> okay. About aye for both. Um, Johnston is not present for the vote, but it passes unanimously. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see you in exec. Yeah. Right.